How could words ever do it justice? In the Grand Canyon, one may see the vast storybook of time opened by the Colorado River. From this fierce, relentless force of nature tears its way through the Grand Canyon. The beauty of the Grand Canyon is and humble and uplift the spirit. My God, something sure happened here. The size comes to mind. If not this, something of the beginning of man, reenacted by God himself. So there you have the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, the greatest of all natural spectacles in this land of ours. We call that behavior at uh, Grand Canyon. In the EMS world, uh, it's job security. In the medical world, what I learned was testosterone poisoning. So anyway, I know you, you all have the same burning question right now. If you saw me walk over here, it's like, why is that guy limping? According to my wife, it's because I've got a 15-year-old brain and a 50-year-old tendon in my leg here. My Achilles tendon. And according to me, it's because I was having quality bonding time with my son. But I ruptured my Achilles tendon about uh, three months ago. And uh, anyway, something you never, ever, ever, ever want to do. <laughs> but I uh, uh, want to say a thank you for being here tonight. Uh, on behalf of Michael, Gilleary, and myself, it's a real honor to see all of you here. It's, it's deja vu. It's been 10 years. It seems like yesterday. But many things have changed. And um, what we want to do tonight is uh, talk about this place, and we want to remind all of you that really why we're here is about the Grand King. It's not about us, and we'll come and go, but this place hopefully will exist long beyond we do, what we do. And so, um, uh, one of the things I want to mention too about Grand Canyon, going back to my wife, she uh, says that I have an obsession with the place, and uh, I think Michael's wife Susan says the same thing about Michael. Uh, we like to call it passion, <laughs> you know, and we like to think that what we did with the book is really more about life than it is about death. You know, what can we learn from how people die? We also know that it's through storytelling that really the best lessons are taught, the ones you remember, you know, from when you're really little. And so for Michael and I, it's been many, many decades of, of exploring this place, of, of working in this place, and then wading through tons and tons of data about how people die. And uh, really, you know, we're hoping the biggest thing you learn from tonight is how to stay out of this book. <laughs> we're working really hard to stay out of ourselves. You know, and there but for the grace of God go Michael and I because we really like to explore it. And the other thing we hope you take away from this is we really want to encourage you to go out and explore it. You know, go into the back country, go down the river, hike the trails, maybe climb up beauty. But learn from the lessons that other people, you know, unfortunately suffer bad outcomes from, and go in there safely and, and hopefully have an experience that leaves you with fond memories rather than painful ones, and stories that you, you know, live to tell about rather than people read about. So anyway, uh, moving along, why, why a book on death? Some things haven't changed. I'm going to let Michael explain our, our reasons for the book on death. Um. Tom and I actually got the ambition to write this book completely independently of one another and from different angles. Tom was a canyon hiking addict and I was a river guy and enough things had happened around me that were bad things that I started uh, dwelling on, you know, that should have been preventable. That should have been preventable. So I got hooked into uh, looking at the epidemiology of accidents and simultaneously so did Tom, but he was treating the people as they came out and I was sometimes just assisting when I ran into trips that had those kind of incidents. And the, the whole idea was to uh, come up with uh, some predictive value. In other words, just like your mother said, yeah, don't run in the puddle, don't cross the street without looking. We were trying to come up with tips about Grand Canyon where people would come back just the way they left in one piece. Okay, one of the things is really, if you, when you run through this, the statistics, you don't have to go very far before there's an overwhelming trend 
slapping you in the face that young males are the ones who commit <coughs> fatal mistakes and females uh, frequently either don't commit those mistakes or are frequently the victim of, the collateral victim of <laughs> male mixers. And, uh, and this is sort of how things um, flushed out into categories. Now, in different parks, like Yosemite or uh, Yellowstone, you wouldn't have these same categories. For instance, in Yellowstone, there's no such thing as a, as a heat death. In Yosemite, there's no such thing as a heat death. There's a heat death in Yellowstone in a hot pool, but not an environmental situation. There's no such thing as a dehydration death in Yosemite, for instance. And uh, so these are how they break down, in, in, uh, and we'll talk about each one briefly. The, as you can see just from that list, it's going to be close to impossible to dwell very long on any of these things, but some of the specifics to Grand Canyon hold more interest for us than, say, suicide. Heat and uh, falls are, are much more interesting and much more preventable, so we'll dwell on those a little longer. Um, this is a staged EMS photo, all three are rangers, but uh, the system in in Grand Canyon has been refined over many years with a lot of uh, dedicated people and it's really a great EMS response system. Uh, one of the huge problems that people face from back east especially, but even from places like Northern California or Oregon, is an, a lack of awareness of what heat really is and also kind of what dry really is. You know, all of you in this room probably have had people visit you from other parts of the world and, and you've had to explain what hot really means. But eggs do fry down there and, and so do people. One of the classic, most of you, if you're from Flagstaff, will remember the story. NAU student Bryce Gillies, this is just a few years ago, two and a half years ago, and uh, Bryce was a pretty bright young lad, uh, engineering, physics student, member of Engineers Without Borders. He decided to celebrate his 20th birthday by doing a hike in Grand Canyon, and he sort of perused the internet, just hit, hit it hard, and uh, settled on one Backpacker Internet article to describe the um, Surprise Valley to Pete's, uh, Surprise Valley Thunder to Pete's loop, then along the river up to Deer Creek, and, and back up to Surprise, back up to Esmeralda, back up to another um, point. He couldn't get any buddies to go with him, and he no. fiddle-fartered around on that day, July 19th, and, and uh, a lot of details are in the new book, which probably will be out this year late, not next year. Be that as it may, he fiddle-fartered around, uh, didn't take maps, stopped for directions, and finally hit the trailhead somewhere, this is guesstimated, at three or later in the afternoon. So he started hiking with minimal amount of water down that trail. Some of you, I can't see very well, but some of you have hiked this hike off the rim. Raise your hand. Some of you know what it's like. Hot. Yep. <laughs> this is not Bryce. This is, a, this is a lady off the internet. She knows nothing about this talk tonight. <laughs> But we threw it in here just because of the deceptive. I don't know how many people have had the same experience when they first looked into a Grand Canyon, but the, uh, the actual hike is down in there and beyond the Esmeralda region and all this other stuff. She's at the top at 7,000 feet. And uh, it looks sometimes very deceptive that you actually hit a golf ball to the destination, even though it's more like eight miles. This is the only water, most of you know this, but this is the first water for someone hiking off the rim, and it's about seven or eight miles, something like that. Um, this is another view of thunder coming out of the Muaf. So this was Bryce's uh, gotta make it or else. The route starts in the upper right corner, up there at the trailhead, wiggles on down. Remember, this is July 19th and one of the hottest days of the year, and it was probably, uh, I think some of you up there in the neighborhood measured it at 90 degrees that afternoon on top. And uh, again, he took minimal water. We think, and a lot of this is reconstruction, so it's supposition on our part, but by the time he got off this area up here where it says thunder is 